No live? Are we? Well, should we? We're not. Are we live? We have added a new feature thanks to the team at Doolittle um, that we are live streaming on, is it y'all's YouTube channel? The Doolittle YouTube channel, um, our panel for today. We've had a lot of feedback that it'd be great for others throughout the region to be able to gain access to some of the conversations and content. So not only are we live, but it'll be recorded so that we can go back and view it or share the link on the YouTube channel, which um, is a really great feature. So thank you so much for setting that up for us today. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our next round table. Um, as Carolyn and the team walk up and get settled, um, I'll just provide a little bit of um, context and background, especially for those partners who might be new. So about um, a year ago, actually, we had the one year anniversary celebration last month. Um, the region launched our first regional economic transformation plan called Northwest Florida Forward. Um, and it had kind of five key focus areas, one of those being entrepreneurship and innovation. So um, tip consultants, tip strategists was hired to develop the plan and uh, they kind of get it, did a deep dive of the region met with over 800 stakeholders so that as they put together the strategic plan and for each of those focus areas they developed a matrix an implementation matrix where they recommended kind of some key strategies and tactics that we as a region could implement to enhance the success of entrepreneurship and innovation and the other focus areas were talent infrastructure quality of place and business vitality um, so what we've decided to do this year is really take a deep dive into each of those sub strategies that were recommended, not necessarily with any specific objective or action or project, but just to be able to better understand um, the great things that are happening in the region and other opportunities for us to collaborate and work together. So with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Carolyn Fries, who's the director of the Doolittle Institute, who's graciously offered to moderate our conversation today. We want it to be very conversational in nature. So um, please feel free to ask questions as we go and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, and thank you all for joining us today, whether you're here at Northwest Florida's Bay College in beautiful Northwest Florida, the panhandle of Florida, or if you're out there in YouTube either today or sometime in the future, thank you for joining us. And thank you to Northwest Florida Forward for organized, organizing today's events and many others to drive economic vitality and growth in our region here. I'm Carolyn Fries, the director of the Doolittle Institute and moderator for today's session. This event is being broadcast live on the Doolittle Institute YouTube channel. And we're here to, dis to explore and discuss Northwest Florida's research landscape and opportunities for commercialization and, op and entrepreneurship. Before introducing the panel, I'd like to take a moment to share some history on commercialization of public research. Prior to 1980, the U.S. government retained ownership of inventions created and developed with the aid of federal tax dollars. While the government offered non-exclusive licenses to anyone who wanted to practice an invention, very few federally funded technologies were flowed into the private sector for commercialization. Enacted in 1980, the Bayh-Dole Act was designed to facilitate the commercialization of federally funded research by encouraging cooperation among government, industry, and academia. The legislation patent, pat, championed patent ownership as necessary incentive for private sector investment in the commercialization process and opened the door for small business academic institutions and nonprofit research organizations to retain ownership of and commercialize inventions developed using federal funds. Since that time, many technologies used by us every day were born from federally funded research and commercialized by industry. The microprocessor, cellular technology, the liquid crystal display, GPS, and even the internet, to name a few. Considering that historical background, we're honored to have representatives on our panel from industry, academia, and government to discuss this exciting and relevant topic. To my immediate left, we have Mr. Lawrence Tinker, who is the head of the Florida Institute for the Commercialization of Public Research. To his left, we have Scott Swanson, Tech Transfer Program Manager with the Doolittle Institute. Next, we have Mark Rolch, who's Assistant Vice President of Research at the University of West Florida. And finally, we have Bill Louts, who is the Office of Research and Technology Application, or the ORDA, at the Air Force Research Labs Munitions Directorate. 
So thank you all. And starting with Lawrence, if you would just kind of give me a little bit of background on yourself and your organization. Let me use the mic. That would probably be helpful. Give it a couple of seconds. Okay. Oh, yeah, short. So uh, as Carolyn said, I'm Lawrence Tinker, and I introduced myself earlier with the Florida Institute for the Commercialization of Public Research. We're a, an organization, a not-for-profit organization, that's been in the past funded through the legislature to work with companies that are licensing technologies out of universities and research institutions around the state of Florida. Uh, and those, over the past seven years we've uh, worked with about 70 we have 72 companies actually in our portfolio right now around the state that are companies that have licensed technologies from various universities and research institutions uh, we have worked with many more than that some of them didn't qualify for our program of matching funding which we had which we were able to match private investment into those companies uh, doing about in the last seven years about 190 million dollars worth of funding, private funding coming into our companies. Um, and we've done technologies from everything from biotech and drug development all the way to uh, oyster ranching uh, with, with one company. Uh, and so it's, it's a, a diverse group of uh, companies, a uh, number of them in Northwest Florida that I've been involved in uh, because I cover this region of Florida. Um, and that's what we're, we're uh, doing. Thanks, uh, Scott Swanson. I'm with the Doolittle Institute. Doolittle Institute is a partnership intermediary agreement organization. It's a not-for-profit and we are here to support the Air Force Research Labs Munitions Directorate I work specifically with the Tech Transfer Program Office. Had a history with Tech Transfer, um, first uh, career in the military, so had the opportunity to support our folks in the field as a special ops and uh, rescue helo pilot and a predator program, a uh, number of entrepreneurial programs after I retired, and then went on for graduate studies in technology and commercialization, working with the University of Texas IC Squared Institute. We help a number of partner universities uh, offshore as they develop uh, technologies out of the lab, whether or not they have commercialization potential here in the US. And do a similar thing here in the lab, assisting the scientists and engineers uh, looking at their technologies for commercialization potential. And just a number of the tools that we have out there, cooperative research and development agreements, so folks in the community uh, that are looking to research and cooperate with the uh, folks in the lab and work with the educational uh, partnerships at EPA, uh, looking to do the same thing with their groups. Thank you. I'm Dr. Mark Ross. Uh, I'm the Assistant Vice President for Research at the University of West Florida. Prior to coming to the uh, University of West Florida, I was a peer review officer for NASA uh, we got a contractor for one, so I, I reviewed anything that had to do for humans in space. My PhD is in exercise physiology. Um, I left NASA to work for the National Institute of Health. I was a peer review officer at the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for five years, and then I went to the program side. So if you know the difference between the two, and, uh, I did SBIRs and other, other reviews um, there, so I had a lot of experience in developing grants and working with people to develop their, their grants. I was really brought into UWF to build research. So if you guys don't know or not, we, we did $41 million in research last year uh, from the herd survey. So uh, we've got a lot of changes going on at UWF. We got some really good faculty coming in and we brought some faculty in and uh, with the new state legislation, we got more faculty we'll be able to, to bring on board. Uh, at higher levels of research, we can do that. So uh, we're applying for a lot of grants. We've applied for over $50 million in grants. And we really look for entrepreneurs and others who, who need that research tie-in, something that, that uh, if you just need a little more help to, to design your project or something like that. So that, that's what we could really be here for. I'm Bill Lopps. Uh, I work at uh, the research lab uh, on uh, Edwin Air Force Base, the munitions director at uh, my Role right now is the program manager basically for the technology transfer to try to get the technologies that are being developed in the labs, getting licensed out to other companies and, and, uh, and, and 
try to maybe get some uh, startups around those. Um, but prior to this, I returning to the area a little bit. I was at Sock also, so I had a lot of time at Herbert Field, so I, I knew the area pretty well. Um, but um, most recently, I come from the past 11 years. After I got out, uh, I, I started working in, in technology licensing with Honeywell, uh, licensing out turbine engine technologies uh, in the mechanical systems division. But past 11 years, I've been at Arizona State University managing the technology transfer program there. Uh, for all the physical sciences technologies with uh, pretty dramatic growth over the time that I was there. We probably doubled our research uh, dollars, uh, I think we're up to six or seven hundred million dollars annually now on research. Uh, went from maybe five licensing deals to probably 30 or 35 licensing deals uh, a year. So pretty dramatic growth um, and I think that's hopefully some of the things we can bring to, to the area. I think this area is definitely very poised for quite a bit of growth. Okay, great, thank you. Since this is the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Council portion of Northwest Florida Forward, it makes sense that our first question would relate somewhat to entrepreneurship. So specifically, what role does research and commercialization play in a vibrant and successful entrepreneurial ecosystem? Whoever would like to take that first, grab the mic. Well, I can tell you that uh, uh, it's very important in this ecosystem and, you know, entrepreneurs really are uh, a big part of commercialization of technologies. Uh, they, you know, a lot of big companies these days are not, not having these big, large research labs. They're out looking for technologies and for entrepreneurs to be able to take technologies and, and start to commercialize them. It gives them an opportunity to build it to a point where a larger company might want to take over or acquire that technology. And it's very, uh, it's very important that we we foster entrepreneurs uh, to be able to do these commercialization technologies. So uh, being a researcher, I think uh, research drives the commercialization because without the, the research there and a the person to, to come up with the ideas or things like that, then, then you don't have any commercialization or anything like that. Uh, so I'm over towards the other side where these guys take what, what my faculty might do and then we, we build it and, and see if it's a commercialized uh, product or things like that. Um, yeah, I want to piggyback on that. I agree that the research and commercialization function really provides the, the beginning of the pipeline. If you don't have that, you don't have anything to build on. Uh, the reality of this is it's very difficult and uh, in my previous job, the majority of the things that I worked on, the new technologies, most of them don't go anywhere. But that doesn't mean that there's no value to that. You know, as an example, uh, there were quite a lot of um, back-end IT functions going on at Phoenix area. It was a large place; you could get large buildings fairly, fairly cheap. So a lot of companies, big companies, had back-end IT. The university recognized that, invested heavily in the computer science research functions. That led to a lot of startups. Now, many of those startups ended up not going anywhere, but some of them, you know, WebPT, a couple of other uh, startups got going. Pretty soon that started recruiting more and more of this sort of workforce of coders that were coming into the Phoenix area. Now they've got probably 10 different cybersecurity companies that just popped up because they had excess capacity, but a lot of that excess capacity originally came from a startup that didn't go anywhere, but they kind of moved to the area and they got some momentum going and then a few of the companies started taking off. So I think uh, even if you're not successful, don't, don't get upset about that. Uh, those, that's what generally leads to future success. I want to add in, um, I mean, how many of you guys are familiar with SBIR, the mechanisms? So, I mean, that is a really powerful mechanism. Uh, and in the Pensacola region, we were just pulling some data for an I-Corps grant that we submitted to NSF. In the last three to four years, you know how many SBIR applications we had in the Pensacola area? <laughs> Zero. Zero. Do you know what they fund? I, 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 when, when I was there, they funded a woman to make a video about exercise if you're pregnant. $150,000. Every agency has an SBIR possible, and, and that, I mean, it's a great mechanism. And that's really where the university could team Can up with you. Can you tell us what the letter for it again? Like, it's SBIR. SBIR. There's two of them. There's SBIR and STTR. Uh, SBIR, you can link with the university. You don't have to. STTR, you have to be linked with the university. 
but it's a great mechanism. All the different agencies have it. Whatever field you're in, there's three phases to it. The first phase is phase one. You're in the development idea kind of phase. If you get that, it's $150,000. The second phase is actually building it and testing it. That's about $1.5 million, I think. And then the third phase is the marketing and getting it out there. It's, it's a fantastic mechanism, and we just don't use it a lot. I'm going to um, piggyback on, on the other folks here. And yes, that entrepreneurial spirit and the ability to bring some of that tech out. Folks look at the area here, beautiful beaches, the tourism, but there's an awful lot of tech going on in the background between the universities, the labs, and the ability to bring um, some of these unique tech commercialization ideas out there. Lots of, lots, lots of potential. I just want to comment on, on Mark's talk about SBIRs. I've personally been involved in previous companies in SBIRs from phase one all the way to phase three commercialization grants. And, you know, you can really do very well if you're developing a technology. And we, I think in that organization, we, we got over two and a half million dollars worth of funding over those three phases of that program to develop the technology. So it's, it's very important that uh, companies take advantage of those uh, opportunities to get funding. Yes, and for those unfamiliar, SBIR stands for Small Business Innovation Research, and I believe SBIR.gov is the main website there. It's the main website. Yeah. Um, there is a great deal of research taking place in Northwest Florida that maybe a lot of people don't know. Um, you know, starting from kind of west to east, we have University of West Florida on the west side, and then we have Florida State University on the east, with a number of small community colleges in between. In addition, we have the Naval Surface Warfare Center at Panama City. We have Tyndall Air Force Base. We have the Air Force Research Labs. So there's a great deal of research that's taking place in Northwest Florida that people might not even be aware of. So a lot of pop opportunity for commercialization there. With SBIR, are there best practices in other communities by which um, small businesses receive some local kind of technical assistance or support in either realizing that the opportunity exists or walking them through or coaching them through the process? I think there are some. Uh, you can find uh, SBDC. Does SBDC it. does it. And also there are. Uh, and you can also reach out to me. <laughs> SBIR training sessions. Yeah. You can you can uh, find those around too that will help you with the uh, uh, proposal preparation. Yes, yeah, and once or twice a year, the SBR does a road show where they go around the whole country. Um, and there's also several um, conferences that you can attend. Uh, typically, one of them is usually in Tampa each year as well, so not too far from here. I was, I guess, just trying to uncover and peel back the layers on why the zero applications out of them. Is it a lack of awareness? Is it a, I mean, any thoughts on that? Not for me. I, <laughs> I, I think it might be a lack of awareness. You know, the, the state of Florida, Aircraft Florida, offers assistance for SBIR programs. They don't really promote it like they should. And they don't you know that they're in Right. Yes, Enterprise Florida used to have what they called a phase zero <coughs> program where it was very easy to apply and the company could get $3,000 to essentially hire a grant writer or take trips to visit the program manager in advance of the SBIR. Um, but with the recent crackdowns on the budget in the state of Florida, that funding has gone away. So if some of you would like to see that funding come back, I urge you to write your congressman and your state reps and um, senators and let them know that that's something that we're interested in having back again because it was very helpful. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, this one's about funding. We kind of talked about funding in our last deep dive, but you know, it's a big thing for commercialization of research. And it's awesome assumed that it's often assumed that funding is a major issue for startups looking to commercialize public research. You know, do you agree with this statement and why or why not? Yes. With a caveat, I think a big part of the funding is tying your commercialization idea to an idea that is commercializable. So many folks out there have great ideas. They think they're going to have you know the, the, the unicorn. <clears throat> However, it may not have a customer. So being able to identify that and uh, move forward that helps solve some of your funding problem, you're more likely to get funding if you have something that is going to be successful. 
Yeah, and I think uh, the SPDC uh, represented there, I went to one of his workshops uh, recently and they talked about how many companies start and how many fail in the first five years. Isn't it like 80% fail in the first five years, uh, roughly? Uh, and in the commercialized part, so at the university, we'll, we'll develop research, we'll apply for research grants to some of the bigger funding agencies. If during that, that research process, we, we find something that might be have uh, uh, IP or something like that or patentable, um, then we would reach out and we don't have a tech transfer office. I'm a tech transfer office. So we have done a lot of it when I was picking these other agencies. Or I, I'd reach out to the University of Florida or FSU or one of my colleagues there and say, hey, we have a great idea. Let's, let's do, uh, move this through. Um, but finding funding to, to move that I, your ideas is really essential. And if you've got a great idea and it's really marketable, then, then you can find funding for it. Yeah, I think that's a problem is a lot of tech startups that come from a technical person who's maybe a research background, they're only interested in the tech. And when they say we ran out of funding, that's because they were just trying to get funding to do more research. But from a business standpoint, they don't want more research. They want you to work towards a product. So I've always advised the startups that we had at ASU that, look, your first thing that you should do for the next 12 months is just build your a tight 10 to 20 page business slides that says, this is our customer, this is what we're trying to do, this is the business model, this is how we're gonna make money, and then go out and use that to get your funding to do the research. I think they try to do raise the funding that they need to actually build the product, to test the product, which is a much larger dollar amount, whereas if you can go, hey, we need the next 18 months to, to go get more funding, and they constantly really need to be planning, we just need enough money to get the funding going until we find the right partner and the right research capability to actually get the product going. If you have a good business model, that other funding's going to come. Uh, yes, I definitely agree that funding is is an issue for uh, startups and getting commercializing technology. Uh, it's difficult, as as these gentlemen have said. You know, if you if you don't have a good business plan and a good customer, uh, you're going to have a hard time finding funding. And that's one of the things that we emphasize when we're working with a startup company that's commercializing technology. Uh, is that, uh, you know, you have to have an investor pitch that talks to investors. Uh, you know, they're not so interested so much in the details of the technology. They're more interested in how are you going to build this company, how are you going to scale it, and how are you going to make money. And that's how you, what you have to focus on in order to be able to raise funding for your, uh, for your commercialization effort. Kind of continuing on with that kind of money focus, um, for some time now, the majority of investment and entrepreneurial focus across the whole nation has been on software products. Assuming that trend will change, what commercialization challenges do you see for physical products that require manufacturing? And is Northwest Florida prepared to support such commercialization efforts? I, I think the, uh, uh, the that trend will change, but one of the difficulties in commercializing manufacturing and physical products is just the just the cost of doing it. Uh, it takes a lot of capital to start a manufacturing operation. There are ways to maybe work with companies to contract manufacture uh, <coughs> some products that you're working on in terms of physical product. Uh, and I suspect there are resources in this part of the state that you could work with in terms of contract research organization. But having, uh, if you're trying to commercialize a physical product that you're going to manufacture on your own, it takes a lot of capital and that that uh, is really one of the biggest issues. I concur with that. I think there's some advantages here in Northwest Florida. Um, you've got the ability to get um, your infrastructure, your commercial space for small companies you know, who may not have the uh, next um, billion square foot Amazon warehouse, um, but a, uh, a small entrepreneurial startup, there's the space to do that and there's the intellectual capital to assist with those opportunities. Yeah, with the University of West Florida's uh, Triumph Grant, uh, part of that is the innovation network and it would have manufacturing components into that they could work with 
people to, to develop those. And, and I don't know if you're familiar, it was in the newspaper and everything. We just launched the C3D lab downtown in uh, Pensacola. It's It's got, I think, 15 3D printers, and we're ordering some other uh, uh, different ones for aluminum and, uh, printing. And uh, we, we, we brought in two new faculty members into mechanical engineering. Their expertise was in, in uh, manufacturing in those areas. They've been uh, always, we, we've applied for a couple of NSF and DOD grants with those guys. So we'll be building that area. So if there are people in the community that you know of uh, that, that need some other expertise in their manufacturing side and commercialization side, we, we'd be a, a good place to come and talk to and see how we might be able to assist you with some of the labs that we have on campus or things like that. And we do partner with different companies and sometimes uh, I have some funds and I'll internally fund a faculty member to work with. Uh, we're working with a couple of chemical companies here in Florida um, that are uh, our faculty. We have some outstanding chemists at the University of West Florida doing some really great stuff. And we're partnering with a couple of different uh, businesses and they're looking at how we can improve their product. And uh, if it takes off, then my faculty member might not have to work very much anymore. But. Yeah, at uh, Arizona State, we had this problem quite a lot recently just because um, we have uh, uh, a lot of our research is in the semiconductor materials and they would come up with a new invention and in order to build this material, it's going to cost $10 million for this facility. So, and in, in addition to that, like uh, Carolyn mentioned, that over the past five, six, seven, eight years, a lot of the, the VCs and investment firms have been focusing on software, you know, or we would have discussions and they're like, well, we want something that pays off in two years, has a 10 times return, has a lower risk. We're like, yeah, great, we all want that. But I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of those opportunities have been mined already. So I think there's been some success in companies like, uh, we had one startup that, that, that we kind of stole from Silicon Valley, was very happy about it, called Tuft & Needle. I don't know if you've seen their advertisements, they make beds. Uh, so there's a lot of focus on companies that make maybe lower volume, but a very specialized and a very high quality product. Uh, so they don't need quite as much investment as far as manufacturing. They get enough to get going. And even at the beginning stages, they can't keep up with the demand. But once they can demonstrate that need, they can start you know, uh, scaling up and it makes it a little bit easier to get the money and the investment they needed to scale up the product and go for a larger manufacturing. But I think that's a good uh, case. You know, I, I once I got here, I started looking and uh, I found uh, the was it the boat boards here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a great company, a very high quality product. You know, something like that could really spin into just a very large national brand. I think focusing on sort of very high quality, very focused markets that start off with low volume, but then slowly build into something where it could be a much larger company. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. So I mean, there's a, on that topic, you know, there's a number of small manufacturers throughout the country support in all the OS, and um, they're hungry for business. So when you have an entrepreneur that uh, needs uh, available space, maybe uh, just a couple thousand square feet, to start manufacturing the product, these companies are eager to look at talk to them mm -hmm. and, and put together. And uh, it's very low cost because you know the, the startup companies don't have capital to do what they do on their own. So if you look into any of those opportunities from some of the existing companies, there a lot of them are 10, 15 person operations, but they they have good uh, tolerances on what they manufacture and, and uh, they, they're eager to work with uh, other companies. Uh -huh. At UWF, uh, UWF uh, Nicole Giesler, and some of you guys might know from Tech Transfer, she she kind of connects us with a lot of that stuff. So if we had an opportunity, um, she would be my connection. I'd ask her and say, hey, you know, we got a, a student that's got this great idea, or, or you know, we, we manufactured it in the lab. Um, we'd like to expand it, and, and she could help us connect that that make that connection. Yeah, and the Northwest Florida Forward website actually has a page that shows entrepreneurial resources for the region. Um, I think listing some of those companies would be a great thing to have on that page if we don't have them already. So I don't know, Larry, if you could get with Jennifer possibly or Jim Sparks at UWF and, and get those on the list, I think that'd be great. Thank you. 
um, kind of moving over from money to people, um, the potential lack of a robust local technical workforce is a potential issue for Northwest Florida's entrepreneurial community and their ability to commercialize new products. Do you have any recommendations for how we can work around and or improve that situation? Or what is your organization doing to address that specific challenge? So I'll just quickly answer. Uh, the only thing I can tell you to do is to provide training for people uh, in areas that, that you know that uh, uh, companies that are commercializing technology will need those people uh, for their <coughs> operations. Um, I, I don't think we specifically are doing it in that, anything in that area other than supporting our, uh, uh, initiatives like what we're doing today uh, to help with that. I'd just like to say that I think that the community here and the brain power, uh, if you look at the, the folks at the lab at Eglin, um, are a fantastic resource. Um, Brain power alone is, is mind boggling. You combine that with the STEM community and the growth that's happening to invigorate the students in the next generation, um, we may not have as much of the problem as we, as we see out there. I really do think that the, uh, the educational opportunities in that workforce is, is there. Can I, can I add to that and ask you to? To this part as well, is so then is it a technical gap or is it an entrepreneurial knowing enough tech to be able to then do something with it from a business perspective? So I don't know if we can I just add that piece to the question. Is it the entrepreneurial skills that's also lacking? I think the entrepreneurial skills is definitely lacking for folks that tend to be in the high tech side. Mm -hmm. As Bill had talked about, they'd love to focus on the research. And that next step of moving it out, finding the customer on the business side. So maybe there's, that, there's that needs some mentoring. Technical, and then there's business savvy, but there's not correct and in between. Like, okay. So the million cups thing that you were talking about is, is a great place to launch that. Yeah. Um, one of the things with 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 the UWS Triumph application is really the the innovation network is going to have a lot of this this training uh, capability to develop. Uh, the workforce in the areas that are really important to this region, cybersecurity, um, uh, research out in the Gulf, and manufacturing, things like that. Um, we're starting to talk about and think about a second triumph grant. This is something that I've, I've, I've wondered about ever since I walked, walked on the UWF and talking with the manufacturing groups and things like that. They have a real lack of employees and large companies come to look at our area to come and, and they well, you just don't have the employees for us. Um, so I've been looking at and, and we got some great researchers who are outstanding at teaching STEM and they've got NSF grants in that. So I've been wondering, you know, what if we if we as a region, as the eight counties, what if we, we targeted at the fifth grade up and I mean do a 10 year plan if we want to develop students that can have the skills and some of the manufacturing guys said if you give me a person who can do basic algebra do some simple math i got a job for them they can make 20 bucks an hour and uh especially in the rural areas you know we, we're, we're not can we target those you know i look at camps that we have at uwf we got some great camps and the only kids that are there are all the ones from the higher social economic status so so what if, if the next triumph grant is something to really look at developing that next group in 10 years from now that if you took them up through that and you got them excited about stem and mathematics and manufacturing and things like that and show them what the opportunities are and then you bring them up to the state colleges and maybe they get an associate group maybe they come to you to have to get their their engineering maybe they just stay in the manufacturing world or whatever that career is um so that's we've been kind of looking at it and how can we do that how could if we had camps all around the region that, that you know, the, the faculty from UWF and teaming with the high schools uh, and other faculty to teach different classes and get them excited about building robots and other kind of things, uh, having that opportunity. So uh, it could be our next triumph or something like that. Mark, um, 
that's exactly what we're working to do. We're a partner of EWS, the SHU Foundation. Um, we're very much wanting to build that pipeline and connect um, kids with career tech, um, cybersecurity. We've got a program that fits very well with leading kids up towards the university's programs. Um, and we've started with Game Changer Saturdays, where kids come together with their parents and they visit local manufacturers. They speak with um, you know members from, from different areas of STEM and have a chance to explore it. And we've gotten great reception. And even from families where they don't have the socioeconomic background, um, making it accessible to them, uh, making it low cost and sustained by industry, where industry drives what is in that program, has been successful in our in our beta in our beta test that we've been doing, and the demand for it has been so great that we see that um, there's going to be a need across the entire um, Northwest Florida. And so we're looking at other partnerships. We've been talking with Carson over here, who is very skilled young man, uh, definitely an example of UWF's best and brightest, and um, he has curriculum that he's working on and such. And so what we want to see. And this is this is very important with um, with all of the entrepreneurs out there as well. Is um, is a collaborative effort where the Innovation Nation locks in with um, you know Gulf Coast State College may have some things that that reach across. Well, we know that none of us may be in every little corner, but we all have something to add and um, and fit together. And so um, we're building a, a network, um, Technology Coast Network of people that are that are involved in this niche um, from the AFRL um, and STEM outreach has been incredibly encouraging and, and bringing uh, Doolittle and um, the Science Center and some other um, groups together. And I think that we are on the, I, I think we are on the verge of something really big and um, where we can, where we can hit those fifth graders, sixth graders and get them locked in so that they're ready when it comes time to, to enter the workforce. And for anyone that might want more information, that's the SHU Foundation, and I believe it's HSU yeah. Foundation, and if you look them up online, I'm sure there's more information on their website. Thank you. Can I, Mark, Larry? you know, what, what you just said though, is really, I mean, in terms of the, uh, going after trying points to do that in camps, that's something that can come out of this group that could be uh, an objective, because I think that's where we really missing things in terms of uh, going to the rural areas because a lot of kids are that with the rural got education and training to go to manufacturing. And that's what we're lacking here because you have kids here don't necessarily want to go into it because they still have that idea that, oh, I don't want to be in manufacturing. And there's a lot of good money to be in manufacturing. And the companies are lacking the skills that they need for the growth that they also need. So what you just proposed, I think, that needs to be taken down. And, and, you know, yeah, I mean, we got we got some great talent here in this region. And what can we do to, to, if you look at the generation as it moves through, you know, 10 years from now, I mean, it's, it's moving so fast. And, and how do we get them off their phones and, and learning something? Or, I mean, cybersecurity, there, there, it's going to be like 100,000 jobs that are, that are going to be available in three more years. We don't have enough people to put them there. You know, and you don't even need a college degree to get a good cybersecurity job. If you know, I mean, kids are coming out of high school who've been hacking and doing other stuff and get great paying jobs. Uh, and how do we get them excited? How do we get women and minorities and other groups excited in fields that they don't even know? So actually, I have a couple hats that I wear that I can hit on this. Um, the biggest thing, the thing you mentioned, um, you know, we're targeting those the, the higher socioeconomic status, and that's been, I mean, that's a huge problem everywhere. I think. Um, that a lot of those those kids that have the money and have the ability to travel and the parents have the time to take them to those kind of camps. That's the kids that stay in those programs, but it, it doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, so one of the, the nonprofit that I have is actually myself and a couple other students at EWF. We um, actually, as of Wednesday, uh, are filed with the state. Um, so that was an exciting step for us. Um, where inertia education programs, we got to the underserved schools in Escambia. Um, the schools that are D or F ranked, high Title I, high Title X, those kinds of schools, um, and run STEM programs for third through fifth grade. So we're hitting those early. Those students who are getting into that mindset of I can't do STEM, it's too high tech for me. I, you know, I'm not prepared for that. Um, and doing basic activities with them. 
hands-on things where I'm not lecturing at them or they're not looking at a textbook or taking a test, but they're just playing with something. And I say, you know, it's really cool and really fun. That's actually a chemical reaction or something like that and tie it to those concepts. So when they hear that in the classroom, they actually understand what it is we're talking about. And then that will encourage it. So anyway, I don't want to take us too off track. Another hat that I wear and I love to talk about this in the last more is I'm a, a cybersecurity ambassador for the UWF Center for Cybersecurity. And uh, it's a program we just started in December to go out to be high in middle schools and try and get more students into cybersecurity um, because we acknowledge that that's a talent gap. Um, I, I happen to sit in on the uh, talent council's um, discussion at the anniversary. Um, and that's one of their main focus areas. I believe it was manufacturing, cybersecurity, and another area, but that's going to be their focus going forward. Um, so hopefully we can make some progress on that. But just wanted to throw a couple things out there that uh, I'd love to talk about if you want to talk to me. Okay, great. Kelly, you have a question? I do have a question because I feel like you gentlemen, our panel today is the bridge between all of those STEM initiatives and then, and then building businesses out of that. So I think my question about even some of the conversation going on right now is, what are we doing to build that bridge into these STEM education programs? And maybe the question to the panel is, best practices, how do you do that with these with adults? So then how can they translate that to their third graders? So um, this uh, Quinn Studer funded some of our center of entrepreneurism, and we had a round table just recently, and he talked about entrepreneurs within a company and how do you be an entrepreneur within a company and the entrepreneurs and he challenged a lot of our faculty to develop things within their classroom that teaches them how to do that because you know i was a civil engineer in my undergrad and i didn't learn a lot of that stuff and then you know i was fortunate enough when i got my phd before i got my phd i had two businesses and i was a professional ski instructor and i did a lot of stuff but the typical academic may not have done that you know uh, at, at ASU, you, you probably have maybe 25% of the entrepreneurial ones, and the rest are maybe don't know how to even teach a student into that, that field, you know. So uh, challenging our faculty to, to develop some, some things into their classroom that would get them thinking about that. And some of the things Jim Sparks are doing on our campus, the Da Vinci things and stuff like that, uh, the three-minute pitch and other stuff. Uh, we're starting to get there and we're starting to talk about it, not just from the business school, but the other schools that are thinking about it. And a lot of what's been discussed is sort of building that talent locally, but I would say don't overlook recruiting and bringing that talent in. Uh, I don't know who would do it here, whether it be the state or regional, but uh, for us it was the Arizona Commerce Department. And we had just great success in going to California and recruiting people to come in. And, you know, someone who was just recently looking for a job, looking at you know, I had a lot of offers in San Jose for, you know, the you know, two-bedroom condo at $3,500 a month. It just, I don't, it doesn't make sense. And I think the millennial generation is a generation that seems to put more emphasis and focus on those quality of life things. And just, if they know about this area and if they know, you know, companies know that there's a, um, a little bit lower cost of living, a little bit more room, a little bit more capability to grow, I think you can have really good success in recruiting some of those people to come into this area. Okay. <laughs> I want to add one thing uh, to what you're saying. Uh, I think um, the feedback from some successful entrepreneurs is also very helpful, you know, with uh, Studer and some of the other folks out there that um, that can offer a leadership role. Um, for us, it's been Paul Chu um, because he's our founder, but he also reaches out to other business leaders and says, okay, what do you want to see the next young child? You know, what, can, what can they come do from your experience? And I think we could do a better job of tagging those success stories in our community and saying, you know, what made them successful? And, you know, what can we teach the next generation from that? Um, and there are a lot of success stories. They're just maybe not um, tapped by the education the institutes. We, uh, I was at recently at University of South Florida and their research wing, they got some incubator startups for students. And uh, I was, uh, yesterday I was looking, I was one to put up some screens to talk about innovative things. 
and meet with one of the other faculty members and, and they said, hey, you know, we want to turn this room here in our commons into a incubator thing for our students that, you know, they might have a small business. And one of the Florida, one of the people had a cake decorating business. And, the, and so I stopped and talked to her and other ones. And so we are there, uh, we're, we're moving that direction. And I think within the next two to three years, you'll see a lot more of that at, at the UW at the campus. Okay, so we've talked some about the research that takes place here. We've talked about workforce development. We've talked about funding. So just kind of in general, what kind of untapped opportunities do you feel exists in Northwest Florida regarding our research assets or commercialization opportunities here? Well, uh, one of the one of the places you didn't mention earlier was the IHFC. I mean, there is there is in Oops. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised. <laughs> anyway. Uh, there's a lot of untapped research being done there that could potentially uh, go into be commercialized. And it doesn't have to uh, necessarily be uh, the complete technology that you're using, but there, there are, uh, and we've done this with several companies, they licensed a portion of their technology or, or technology out of IHMC that augments their own technology and then that that certainly is an untapped resource i think that afrl is is a very big untapped resource uh, that could potentially be uh, a lot of technologies could be commercialized out there okay so that is embarrassing because ihmc is the reason we moved to northwest florida my husband works there so. <laughs> and uh, we actually had a panelist who unfortunately had to cancel at the last minute today but ryan mccann was supposed to come and speak and ryan is president and coo of cobalt intelligence which is actually housed within IHMC, um, tasked with, to some degree, working with them to help commercialize their technologies. And I wish Ryan had been able to be here to talk more about it, but I'm sure we'll hear more from Ryan in the future. We look forward to what they're doing at Cobalt. I second what the other panelists have said uh, as an example with the lab, being a munitions director, that there may not be some direct commercial applications for many of the things that are done there, but the Again, the brain power and the ideas, things that are going on behind the scenes uh, with the folks there with secondary applications for uh, commercialization, um, definitely an untapped resource. So um, coming from NIH, you know, my, my, I think my, the untapped resource is biomedical. Um, you can also tie manufacturing into biomedical things, you know, stents and so on like that. That's a, that's a mechanical thing. Uh, but in this region, and if you looked at FSU's trial proposal, they're looking at an institute for aging in Panama City, $60 million. Uh, we have an aging population around the Pensacola, Northwest Florida area. Uh, we have some, some really big problems with infant mortality and other things. And at our campus, I've got a handful of biomedical researchers that if I can use the state legislature money or world-class faculty, and we can increase that area in public health. We could really grow that area. And they could, uh, biotech when I was in San Antonio, man, it, it boomed San Antonio in that area. So I think that could be an untapped reason because the Department of Defense even funds a lot of uh, biomedical research and, and health research in that. Yeah, tying off on that a little bit, I would also, you know, caution you to try to Focus on the specialties that already exist, the things that you're really good at. I, you know, I've worked with other regional areas and universities. I worked with the uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, which is a, a big research uh, university that was funded by the government of Japan. And when they first started, they said, you know, it was a big biotech area and they, or time, and then everyone just said, oh, we're going to be the new biotech hub. And it's like, yeah, you and San Diego and Austin and I, you know. Pick something that you've got uh, some local capability and some really good regional specialties in. You know, I kind of advise them: look, Okinawans have the, the longest living people on the planet. So why didn't you focus on where aging hits the tent? Or you're right on the ocean. Why don't you have a marine, you know, uh, technology? So try to focus on things that you have some sort of core capability and you can really, you know, shine with. Okay. I'll kind of take that into a, a follow on potentially as you know, who is missing in this conversation? If you think about Northwest Florida and the people that are here in this room, 
you know, who, who should we be interacting with that maybe we aren't today? You know, when I came here, uh, just I've only been here a couple of months, but uh, talking to my, my friends in Phoenix, most people, um, you know, if you say, oh, I've moved to the Destin area, they go, they either go, I have no idea where that is, what, what, what are you talking about? Or they go, I love that place. I know, you know, I love it. I know everything about it. It's the most beautiful place on the planet. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, or increasingly more wealthy people who are getting second homes in Destin. And the, the guy that was on my son's football team, he had a, uh, the electrical uh, manufacturing business that he had spun out uh, and started up and kind of worked his way up to now. He just was in the financing companies. It's like, I got a home down in Destin. This is where you need to live. And, and you know, I don't know how to connect with those guys, but I don't see those guys here. Those guys can come down here. They retire here. They come for vacation. If they find out about the things that we're doing, if we give them new ideas for companies, new startups, new technologies, you know, a lot of those guys are looking for their next thing or the thing to be full time. He was basically looking for his next full time thing so he could leave Phoenix and come move down to his uh, vacation home, and just retire down here. But he wanted something to bring in. He wanted uh, another company to start or another thing to, to do. And I don't know whether that's finding the main events that these people come back for and just you know, whether those are social events or big fishing events or whatever those guys participate in, somehow linking those guys into this network so that they have a reason to kind of come here full time and it would be very helpful. Yeah, I want to tap off of the, the million cup thing. When we were in San Antonio, there was a, a group of investors there and they, they did a quarterly meeting similar to the eight minute pitch. And uh, it was sponsored by a local company each time and they paid for the lunch. And there, there'd be about 150 people there. And on every table, there'd be a university researcher, there'd be an entrepreneur, there might be a lawyer, and there was an investor on every table. And so the lunch conversation was about what did you do and what can, and then the people who had the business there was kind of pitching us about their business. And then, then we'd have the six that did their big pitch and you could ask them all the questions. But if we could get those people you're talking about into a setting uh, that you have a lunch or something and, and you just start bringing them and, and sometimes there's a great idea and somebody wants it in there. Uh, I remember, so I have sleep apnea and one of the people was talking about if anyone has sleep apnea, you gotta put that old box in your thing when you travel and you carry it. If you're going through the security, they make you take it out. It's like a laptop. And they're, they're, they found this portable one. They designed this portable uh, sleep apnea machine that, that, was, that you could fit like into your shaving kit. And you can take it on a plane with you. And I was like, man, that's great. So I started asking them some questions, but they hadn't done any any studies. So they, they, they knew how it worked, but you'd have to have to do some studies to make sure it works and things like that. And I said, why wow, you gotta link up with us? And, to conduct those studies and things like that. But it was just a great opportunity. And I think you're right, that, that might be missing in the area. We have some, what do they call them, angel, angel uh, things, but I don't see like a real organized one. Yeah, I would say who's missing from the conversation is uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, it's, there's a lots of technology around. You just need entrepreneurs to take technology and make it work and commercialize it. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges we've had, even around the state, is finding good entrepreneurs to commercialize technologies. Uh, and so that, maybe having an entrepreneurial group, the Million Cups things help. We've, uh, we've had a chapter in Tallahassee for a while, and we've uh, done, a, done some of those meetings. They've been very helpful to some of the companies there. So finding good entrepreneurs and the people like you mentioned that are want to retire here, that, but they don't want to retire. They want to continue to do something. Finding those people that have an interest in a certain technology that can be commercialized is, is what's missing. I would say um, our wealth manager community um, may be a good untapped um, connection because often you know they will post um, socials and things like that, um, and they certainly have a network of clients that may be looking you know, to, to come to an event or come to a million clubs. Okay. I have one more written question. Do we have audience questions, Larry? But, you know, there are, uh, you pointed out that there's quite a number of wealthy people in this area that uh, are retired, particularly in Destin and San Destino. And uh, to find out who they are and if they're interested in being an angel uh, individual or group, 
are being involved very difficult. They don't want they they want to know who they because are. they're retired yeah. Yeah. And, and they may have run very successful companies. But that could be because this is the entrepreneurial group. This may be another uh, challenge for us mm -hmm. to try to find a, a you know, suitable way to identify them and somehow get them loosely involved because they don't want to be yeah, uh, yeah. involved to a degree. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's one of the things that we were able to do. Uh, Phoenix also has a lot of, you know, a lot of the retirees there as well. But we would bring it into universities, just a mentor role, so they would help mentor companies. Mm -hmm. But it ended up being they're mentoring, but they're just waiting until the one they find, and then they decide yeah. that's the one I want to put my effort on. Yeah, at the, at the 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 luncheon that we did in San Antonio, you really didn't know. You just introduce yourself, say here's who I am, and and I knew some of the people around the table from the. Uh, and they just say, you know, here was my business. This is what I I, I did. They they would you, you would never know unless you actually knew who they were. You know, when they were wealthy or not. Uh, it was just a, you know, and then you come every quarter and you see some of the same people and you start to get to know more and more people. And it was just a it was a good you know 100, 150 people was a good place to hang out. And you know, I think of my uncle and others that, who were in the area. You know, they would mind coming to a free lunch and sitting down and, and maybe you're engaged with a, a young entrepreneur or a student or something and you, you have a good conversation or whatever. So it might be a, a way to expand the other cups into something else. And we find, you know, other companies that would sponsor the lunch each each time. Uh, and then uh, it, it might be something that we can do. Okay, anybody else in the audience have a question before I give my final question? Yeah, I was uh, curious if any of you all uh, went across this idea of licensing data as a form of IP as opposed to just patents and stuff like that. Um, you can do it. Uh, we, we've done it uh, at ASU. Um, you don't have quite as much protection, and it's kind of easy for someone to, it kind of depends on what, what the data is. Uh, we would do a lot of, we call them know how licenses, where we would just, you know, we had one person who, um, he basically was taking a Wii controller, he hacked into it, and he was using it to build a game so that uh, orthopedic surgeons could warm up on this game using the Wii controller, and he was able to prove that it made their surgeries much more successful and far fewer incidences and things. But he, he you know, all we could really license was the know-how to it because we didn't have the tech, we didn't we didn't have any patents to it. So we ended up doing know-how licenses to companies to be able to just take that and then build their own product around it. Uh, and most people would they built basically a controller where you didn't have to infringe on any of the, the Wii controllers IP. You just had to take the Wii controller, attach it to this device, and then you could you could do everything. But uh, you're usually going to end up with lower value license agreements. But a, a good model for that is a lot of non-exclusive so you can do a lot of non-exclusive low dollar values but you've got a lot of licensees um uh, someone maybe a couple of you guys mentioned early stage capital angel money um can you name the two angel funds that are organized in the panhandle i, I don't know if you're aware that there are two yeah i know one is the aim group uh and I don't know if the Nexus has a chapter up for this area or not. Uh, uh, I know they have a chapter in Tallahassee. Check Farms. Is the other oh, Check Farms is the other one, obviously. I should should have known that. I'm on the advisory council. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> so just your point in Destin is a well-made one. There's a lot of wealth there. Uh, it's transient lodging. Right. <laughs> uh, the large yacht, the fishing trip, the big condo, and then gone. I mean, his vacation home was a 3,000 square foot place. He was only here two or three weeks at right. a time. That's pretty standard. Yes. And, and that's an untapped market. But I, I, I would hope that we could grow some more of those structured groups. Yeah, right. That would be ideal. We have East, we have West. That's central. And it could be, so, like you said, some of these adventure or the wealth managers who say, well, we already have a big event and we have 500 people come to this. You, know, you guys can take it back from about the, uh, two years ago when I was first here, I was, me, over at, oh, I was over at AR, ARL and we were talking about the researches that they have there and then the research that we have going on and other, and if we could do like a, a research symposium 
where it has some entrepreneurs coming at and you have your poster, you do your pitch. And uh, the thing at ARL was we were trying to see who can we match up because you guys are just doing some cutting edge stuff. I remember reading some of the things that they were looking for, for, for insects that are trying to figure out how the, the antennae can sense things so that they build their own thing that can fly around, you know? And I was like, Jesus, I don't think I got a faculty member who can figure that out. <laughs> uh, but if you got them together and, and in the region, you know, you can uh, have the different schools or something and participating, uh, and you do like a research symposium or something like that and get them talking, uh, there might be opportunities to, to grow from that. And then you have the business people around that, that they're looking at some of uh, so UWF has a big research symposium on April 9th. If anyone want to come, you're welcome to, to, to see that. You know, you'll see a lot of the stuff that, that we've been doing there. About uh, 600 students will be participating. They got posters and stuff up there. Uh, on, uh, we do oral ones. We do pitches. We do the posters. And then we got music and theater and other stuff. But uh, 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 I think if we can get that around, that might be a, a great way to get, get people talking. Anybody else in the audience? Yeah, um, I somebody. Um, you mentioned the number of failures in small businesses, but those are numbers generated out of this is the number of companies that registered, and then a year later, how many of them still exist, and five years later, how many of those exist, and that number can get to be a little bit wishy-washy. But I've been in entrepreneurship for 24 some odd years, teaching entrepreneurship at the college level and, and working with a lot of entrepreneurs and started an angel group a number of years ago and I've worked with angel investors. We talk about innovation and you gotta remember that it's not just somebody who in the shower says, aha, I have an idea. <laughs> you know, it really has to be somebody who has the know-how to bring at least part of that thing together. In other words, they have to have some sort of a skill, and then they have to be able to partner with those people who also know software or electrical engineering or mechanical engineering and all the other pieces. And if you get the team, the people who have sort of the knowledge together, there's money out there. There, there is always money chasing good ideas, but you, you got to be able to put the whole package together. It has to be a, a, a reasonable business plan. It has to be a reasonable growth prospect it has to be a reasonable team that can figure these things out as they go it, it's not just somebody who just says aha i have an idea i mean ideas are great but they, they're not just ideas until you put the whole thing together and i wanted to make certain that we focus on the fact that when we talk about northwest florida we have a tremendous amount of people who are government contractors who work for a government contractors or who are in one of the research labs or something like that. And these people are really sort of a catalyst for the start, you know, and, and we need to leverage these people. We need to encourage them to sort of, you know, you know, a lot of these guys are making a pretty good living. They get off work and they go home. And it would be nice if we could get them to, you know, maybe stop for a second and maybe work with somebody on a project for, an hour or two, you know, because some of them don't want to really obligate themselves to a whole great big project. But if you kind of set up like a mesh network where you've got people working on different pieces of stuff at one time, that's really how to leverage all of the technology in, in, in this panel. And and I think that that's really the growth area that we, we sort of got to put together if we can. Thank you. Thanks, but any other audience questions? If not, I'll Got one more? Had the opportunity to participate in a, a new little uh, sponsored uh, hackathon down in Tampa um, not too long ago. And I was just wondering if there's anything planned uh, like that up here in the panhandle. I know uh, Business Innovation Center does uh, startup weekends, which is an opportunity for some of the local technical folks to get with those folks that had that aha moment. And we've seen some of that. But I uh, was wondering if there was anything more formal associated with a uh, hackathon or start weekend type projects uh, coming up. UWF does a hackathon. I mean, we have a competition. And then, then we travel down the other one too. And then they also have a, um, they have a robotics competition in the area, things like that. So, and when, when we build a new cyber uh, 
in the cyber center that's going to have battle area and things like that. We'll be doing a lot more of that and linking with uh, ISMC and, and those things. So you'll see a lot more of it. And I had the opportunity to attend the hackathon a couple of years ago at UWF, and I was just amazed at the quality of projects that the students came out. They've got a lot of fantastic and very talented students there at UWF working on that. So I think I will head on to my final question, which is kind of a generic one, a nice way to roll things up. And we'll start with Lawrence first. And, and how can an innovative or new company work with your organization? Well, and today, the way they would work with us is uh, they would need to be uh, licensing technology out of either a university or a research institution. Uh, now that could potentially change in October, November of this year, where we may be able to work with any technology development company. Uh, and they would just basically have to go to our uh, website and apply online for support. And uh, we take them through our process, evaluate their uh, potential, help them build an investor pitch, get them involved with uh, and introduced to some potential investors, and then uh, provide some uh, funding for them. I encourage folks that are interested in working with partners in the lab to reach out to us, whether it's licensing the technology, uh, helping with tech transition uh, to serve the warfighters within the lab, or just looking for other resources out there, we may be able to steer you in the right direction. So um, what, what uh, he was talking about getting people together, that's, that's kind of my job at UWF. So I, I walk around campus, I call them, I do my walkabouts, and I go around and I talk to different faculty, see what's going on, what do they need. So my job is kind of to have a good feel for what's happening across campus. So if you know an entrepreneur, they have an idea, they have something, they can reach out to me, or Mark Ross, you know, they contact me and I can see who can I set them up with, who might be interested in working with them, or has those skills, and, and then, then I can make those connections with you, or it could be two or three or four different people that would brainstorm on an idea. And we do that a lot of times. I have a lot of ideas, and I get the engineers together, and they go, no, Mark, that ain't gonna work. Okay, I'll try another one. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's pretty much what we, what we do there, and what my role is. So, uh, anyone that would be interested or interested in SBIR or other types of grants that, that we apply to, and we're sometimes looking for people to partner with in other grants that we're, that we're looking for. So. We're there to, my role is really to support our faculty and others, so we, we certainly encourage people to, if they have ideas or things like that, come reach out to us and see what we can do to, to support them. Additionally, we overlap a little bit with uh, Doodle because they, they're our, our partners uh, with the labs, but uh, the main goal is really to get the technology out of the labs and licensed into a company. So if you have people interested in, in just seeing what kind of research we're doing and interested in starting a business around some of those technologies. In addition, we have uh, research agreements where a company can, maybe it's unrelated to our technology, but it's something that they're working on if they want to do some joint research with the laboratory. Uh, there's capability to use some of the equipment they have, so you have some, some of their equipment tested, maybe because of the, the specialized equipment that we have available on, on base. And then in addition to that, we do educational partnership agreements with other researchers of the universities so that we can do joint research together that hopefully uh, can develop into a startup company. We just are in the process of completing a, a joint patent license agreement with uh, Florida State University, one of their researchers came for a summer program and worked with our, our researcher here. We got a joint patent and they've already got a startup lined up to license the technology. So I think um, being that we're a government institution, it's a little difficult, a little bit slower to move. I think I see working with other regional local universities is a good way to maybe move a little bit quicker and, and get the technology into a company quicker. Okay, thank you. And if anyone's interested, we do have some booklets up here that talk about the research that's going on at the Air Force Research Labs here. So feel free to grab a booklet on your way out. And thank you all for coming. And um, thank you to the panel for participating. This is a great event. And I'll hand it back off to Jennifer. Um, and please join me in also thanking Carolyn for facilitating the moderation.
thank you all again for offering your insight, your thoughts. Um, this has been incredibly informative for me. I know helpful to get some thoughts and ideas flowing. Really appreciate the engagement. Um, before we close, we always want to um, round out with any opportunity to share upcoming events, um, other opportunities to collaborate. I know we heard about the research symposium that Dr. Ralsh referenced um, April 19th. Is April that 19th, 10 o'clock till 3. Okay. Any other upcoming entrepreneurial innovation related events um, or other opportunities to collaborate? The um, UWF Hackathon, which was our draft name for the event, PC took over and we went for Code Fest. Code Fest. The third Code Fest is this weekend, April 6th, 7th, and 8th, in the College of the Hal Marcus College of Science and Engineering building with the awards and, and judging over in the Commons. It's gotten large enough to where we've outgrown the building, engineering building. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things I was wondering about, you know, would it be worth it? So I've traveled around the country and done grant writing workshops for a lot of different universities and things. Um, would it be worthwhile to do an SBIR workshop here in the, the Northwest region and then bring a couple other people who've done have been successful and Larry and others, you know, we could do a one day SBIR workshop in the area and then what it would do for me is I'd get to know what a whole bunch of people around here are thinking about and how could I team other people up with them, you know, or at other places around the region. So there's, there's, I don't remember the name of the company, but there's some people who come out and do like a two or three day training. So everyone who wants to yeah, learn how to yeah. do SBR. So but they charge them a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> we, we would do it. We would do it. The Doolittle Institute has something in the works on that. So let's oh, get together afterwards. Fantastic. Can I take you back? So the April 19th event at UWF, and I'm probably going out of my wheelhouse slightly, but Jim Sparks has invited a small group of tech entrepreneurs to come in and visit with just certain of the pitch groups for some of the research students' projects in order to provide an interaction with them and give them some feedback. So if you have any of those kind of entrepreneurs around, holler at me and I'll see if I can get Jim to get you in the door, maybe to sit in on that. It's 10 that deal is from 10 to noon. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. It's like a three ring circus. Right. Well, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And, you it's know, it's a, if you're looking for an employee, it's a great place to see what kind of students are doing. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if they're all standing by their posters and they're going to talk about their research and things like that. So. It's a great event. Yeah, it is. It's really grown, you know, since, uh, since I came here. We went from about 115 to now where, where there's, you know, about 600 students that are involved in it. Kelly, so always a reminder for the 11th, which is um, a week from Wednesday for our 1 million cuts kickoff. I um, also just want to just kind of throwing it out there, um, October 1st and 2nd is uh, IT and Wire, which if uh, anybody's familiar with that, it's Innovation Technology Entrepreneurs Network and um, planning a two-day event in Pensacola, so October 1 and 2. Fantastic. Emilio? Yes. Uh, on April 28th, which is a Saturday, so if you can make it, uh, it's going to be Invention Convention. Uh, joint partnership between both of the college at SUPC and uh, the Native Research Lab. We're going to be showcasing all the inventions that uh, students, faculty, and researchers are doing. Um, and we're going to have some local companies as well showing their inventions and uh, how we are applying that into a commercial setting. So it's a great opportunity to maybe uh, come explore the area and see what all these two organizations are doing together. And uh, that will lead to our competition mission next year, uh, where students will be given a problem from a sort of commercial organization where they need to come up with an invention to be applied for that company. So uh, we're going to do this as a screening opportunity to see what kind of interest we have in the community. We expect uh, multiple counties to show up since we're going to have high schoolers showing up their inventions as well. Where is that going to take place? Um, we're going to be at the Gulf Coast Lake College and FSU campuses. We're going to pretty much, since we are across the street from each yeah, other, yeah, yeah. we're going to close pretty much down this, uh, the street for people to come back between both campuses. And then the Native Research Lab will bring their equipment and their people uh, to both of our campuses. So it's going to be an uh, open activity. We're going to have on Monday tools in the pool, cool. um, incubators yeah. showing their uh, inventions, and pretty much the Advanced Technology Center and the FSU PC campus. To be hosting the whole So, one more hand? Sure. Uh, we have a YouTube commenter who said um, she is, it's Maisie from the Gulf 
Kent State College Business Innovation Center. And they say on April 25th is the next Enlightened Entrepreneur event at the Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast State College Advanced Technology Center, 6 p.m. Awesome. Thank you. So um, obviously spring is a busy time, but it does remind me that initially we had tried to kind of create a centralized listing for regional events. Um, so we'll follow up. Um, thank you for sharing these in person, but um, someone will send a follow-up email. If you do have an event coming up in the next few weeks, if you'll email us kind of the hyperlink, whatever the boilerplate description is, that'd be awesome. We'll see if we can aggregate them someplace, both on the Northwest Florida Forward website. Also, um, at Gulf Power, we send out a community and economic development newsletter quarterly to about 8,000 partners throughout the region. And we always like to highlight any regional events that are open to the public. So we'll also use that as a platform. One final plug for us as well, um, for those of you who have been to our um, economic symposium in the past, this is our 22nd year hosting um, an economic symposium. Traditionally, it has been held um, on a Monday and Tuesday. This year, based on a lot of feedback over the years, we're shifting it to all day Thursday, half day Friday. And so um, we are going to loosely be opening up registration for that event via our newsletter, which is supposed to go out in the middle of this month. Um, but the dates this year are October 10th and 11th. Thursday and Friday, we've already booked our keynote speaker, um, Vikram Mashramani. He's the author of Boombustology, um, kind of a global macroeconomics guy who's really fascinating. Um, he's a fellow at Harvard and has done some really interesting work. And um, we're building out the agenda right now. Um, it's a great opportunity to join together with about 600 partners from throughout the region to talk about um, the future of Northwest Florida. So. Yeah, I thought I was um, What yeah, is that you, Jim? Yeah. One second, we've got Lloyd sharing an event, and I'll circle back to you. Yeah, there's a couple of events coming up for and, and for anybody, I guess, but it's for startups like Emerge America is, is this one down in Miami Beach. Uh, it's a, a pretty big um, uh, conference now. And it should be pretty interesting. Uh, but the larger one is uh, uh, Collision in, at the end of the month, starting at the uh, beginning of next month in, in uh, Milwaukee. So those are two of the major startup conferences that are, that are going on. And Collision should have like you know, about 25,000 more people there. Yeah. Those are great reminders. Awesome. Jim, did you have an event you wanted to share real quick? Yeah, if I could just toss in there. Um, thank you, Patrick, for mentioning the thing on the 19th. Anyone's welcome to that. But also, next Wednesday, April 11th, from 4 to 6 p.m., we're having our first Argo Alumni Stories event at UWF in the conference room. And really encourage you all to come to this. fantastic things happening in the region. Thank you all. Um, briefly, before we go, wanting to recap with our future meetings, you might remember that we shifted today's meeting. It originally was supposed to be last Tuesday, but due to spring break scheduling, uh, we kind of told everyone and decided to do it today. With that in mind, our regularly scheduled April meeting is on the 24th, so we meet on the fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, what we have talked about and kind of mapped out for our next deep dive next month is really um, kind of doing a panel discussion on accelerators and incubators throughout the region. So we have a few of our key partners that we've had preliminary discussions with listed up there. Um, so we'll be following up to map out uh, those details. But if you have any other ideas, please let me know. And then Wes and I were kind of chatting a little bit today. It sounds like maybe our topic for May really needs to be a deep dive roundtable on some of those entrepreneurial related um, programs and curriculum and other training opportunities we have throughout the region. So, you know, certainly the Shoe Foundation, Young Entrepreneurs Academy, the entrepreneurship programs at UWF and FSU, some of our state colleges, as well as some of the career academies we have at the middle school and high school level. So help us be thinking through that. If you have any ideas for that panel, it sounds like that's certainly a conversation um, that we could have perhaps in a directly collaborative way in regards to a triumph application or something in that context. So um, we hope to see you. Those next two meetings will be meeting here. Um, and Carolyn, I'd love to talk to you about continuing to do the YouTube thing. This has really worked out well. We've had, I think, some some good interaction, and it'll be awesome to be able to catalog this. And, and
save it. One um, just final note I wanted to share. Um, Pam, as I mentioned, our co-chair, um, my co-chair for the council couldn't be here today. She's sick. Um, but I'll be um, taking on some new responsibilities at Gulf Power with our foundation. So I'll be transitioning out um, from my role at Gulf Power with being kind of our key lead on entrepreneurship. And I'm so excited and thrilled to work with Wes um, Hudgens, my colleague at Gulf Power. Um, so he'll be transitioning into kind of this organizer yeah. role. Officially in May, we'll be working together over the next few weeks. Um, and he just brings a fantastic collaborative spirit to this work. And I know you'll really enjoy working with him. So wanted to make that formal introduction. You might be hearing from him via email in the coming weeks. Um, but he and then Nazi Dolar as well on Pam's team will kind of pass the baton and and take that over and really appreciate their leadership and willingness to step in. So we'll be in great hands, um, but have enjoyed working with you all and I'll continue to, to come through April and then make that transition. Um, but on that note, please be safe driving home. We appreciate the chance to connect with you all today and please feel free to stay after and, and chat and connect a little bit longer, but awesome work. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. i yeah, 